Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of the Dog Tribe podcast. Um, we're going to get straight to it. Today, uh, we're sitting here with the found training director, Justin Wilcox. And so Justin and I have known each other for a long time, what, like uh, eight years or so, uh, in and out. Um, actually, shorter than that, you've been training for a little longer than that. And I think, what, like uh, six years, something like that? Yeah, because I first got introduced to you through a PSA. Right, right, right. At the time, um, I remember that. And so what's interesting is that obviously you joined the team here and during COVID and you were running your business at that time. And I think that was really interesting to me is because a big thing that I attribute to your success and like found success is that you had that business growth mindset. Like you had that entrepreneur mindset, like I want to do my own thing. Um, and then you joined a team that was like, you know, which was kind of a sacrifice. And I've always, always understood that about you. Uh, it was a sacrifice giving up kind of your own thing and joining another team, but now you're a training director. Obviously, we're talking about all these bigger projects and things that we got going on. Obviously, one of these, uh, Dog Tribe is one of those projects. Um, and so I kind of want to get your perspective about your journey here, like obviously giving up your um, business, joining the team, um, and, you know, get to know a little, and then obviously discussing a little bit of like what we've learned. We have a full like apprenticeship program right now, and I think that, it's a great time to shoot this episode because the first thing that comes to mind is that we now hit a benchmark goal, which is like a hundred percent of our training team is homegrown. So meaning yep. that we hired them as a training apprentice, we trained them, we spent the years of like headaches, ups and downs, obviously recruiting things, people don't work out, things don't work out. And then we get into a situation where you're like, holy crap, like, okay, so everybody on that training team now is growing up here at Fountain. And it's kind of interesting because some of these guys um, have never worked anywhere else. Like they joined Found and they're like, this is the dog play yeah. I want to be at. And so they don't have perspective and they definitely don't have your perspective, which is obviously you, you work for a couple of different places. You've had different types of mentorship. And so you kind of get to witness things. We were talking about this before we started shooting. You get to witness things from a, that's kind of the experience that I wanted, but that's not the experience that I got. And so now you're yeah. participating in and creating that experience for other people. So yeah, man, tell us about your journey, uh, how you get started and you know, what has been the journey here for you at the company? Yeah, for sure. So I've been in the dog industry since 2013. Um, wasn't training, just working in daycares and things like that. And ultimately I saw a lot of value in helping dogs. There were a lot of dogs struggling to be successful in groups. Um, there were a lot of dogs that were very difficult to handle that we would have to kick them out because we just weren't equipped to actually handle those dogs. And I saw a greater value in learning how to actually help them. And so I started that journey a few years after I had been in the daycare system. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had a few bad experiences on my way up in the daycare industry. Um, ended up finding a mentor when I was about 21. And that's where I really started to learn dog training, Nipopo in particular, um, which I kind of fell in love with pretty quickly once I saw what it could do with dogs. And, you know, like I said, I had a very, I would say, interesting mentorship experience, right, where I got a lot of really good knowledge, uh, but I had to develop a lot on my own in a lot of situations, right, kind of being left in situations that were quite difficult back then. But... Um, you know, I'm, as we sit here now, very happy that I experienced because it made me develop a lot faster. Right. Right. Um, I had to develop a certain level of confidence a lot faster. Um, and yeah, so I'm very grateful for those experiences. Uh, but yeah, all those led me up to around 2019, starting to come to the point where I was like, okay, I'm having a really bad time working for other people. I do think I'm ready to go out on my own and actually start to develop something for myself. And so that was the journey. It was literally right at the end of 2019, obviously 2020 COVID was in full effect. And that's ultimately that year where I got the call from you. Um, and like I said, it was tough. I had some clients here and there, but obviously people were being a lot more uh, mindful with their funds and, you know, word of mouth was a little bit more difficult. And so, yeah, luckily I got the call from, from you and came and joined the team. And the thing is, is, once I got here, it didn't necessarily feel like a sacrifice. It was, if there was a sacrifice of anything, it was just being able to make all decisions for myself at all times. But 
like we kind of discussed during that time in those earlier meetings, I saw the value in working with a strong team that's like-minded and uh, we're headed in the right direction, right? Working for an individual that has the right mindset about dog training and sees the value and how we really can help these dogs. Um, it was a no brainer for me, honestly. I mean, I'm, I've learned so much since I've been here in the short time that I've been here. I don't regret it at all. Yeah. And I was going to add, you know, out of like the, you know, being in a bigger facility space and being in the daycare, we kind of have the same background. Obviously I started in a daycare space, um, a little earlier, I think since like 2007, 2008 and, um, kind of grew from that, but out of like, I got the benefit of being, I think the seventh employee of this entire block now that it is for, you know, dog businesses here on this block. And, you know, so I witnessed a lot of people like coming in, hiring people didn't work out, people that signed up for dogs and they're like, I actually hate dogs and people that like love dogs, but they loved it in their own way and kind of people coming in and out. And what, what I don't think I've ever told you this, but you are actually the, I think might be the first person I've ever recruited, you know, cause I, and I think for me, um, that's like a lesson for, for like future business ventures in terms of like finding people. But I think that you're the only person that I've actually recruited and say, um, you know, like, obviously you got your own thing, but if we need some help. Why don't we like come together and see if you want to, you know, take on this position and, and grow yeah. from it. And um, it's very interesting for me because a lot of the times, you know, people that, you know, want to apply here, they reach out and everybody that like wants to work here, I think that sometimes has a different mindset, right? And I think that there's like a, um, something to be said about when you go out and find someone and you're like, hey, I know we were talking about um, um, your business at the time, trying to get a little, you know, trying to get it up and and obviously in a very difficult situation of COVID. And so, um, so that was an interesting fact. And I did want to talk a little bit about the challenges. I think that one of the topics that have recently come up is, uh, people are going to hate me for this, but sometimes how easy things have gotten, right? And I've talked to a couple of my buddies um, when they talk to Oscar Mora or talk to, you know, other people in the industry and they're like, man, like they got everything there. You know what I'm saying? You got the facilities, you got the kindergartens, you got the teams, you know, like the whole thing. And that from the entrepreneurial mindset, I think that a lot of times you end up being lonely and alone and like, or as a solopreneur, as I would call it. And so things have definitely gotten easier because of infrastructure that we've built, right? And I think mm -hmm. that some people have pointed that out um, and so one of the things that I brought up in the last apprentice meeting, uh, for the intro level guides, kind of getting their feet wet with dogs was specifically the supervisors. I said, part of our job now is to make sure that people are challenged because there's a certain level of character that's built for that, you know, for that, um, individual. And when things are easy, I think that, um, you know, people don't build the character that is necess that's necessary to get companies to this point. And that's kind of what I always get, um, that's kind of what I get scared about. And it's like, you need to be able to put people through experiences uh, in a healthy way that develops the traits that we want to see in our team. So we want the traits, but we're not willing to give them the experience or the skills necessary to develop those traits, right? And I think that when you were saying, hey, I've had challenges, um, coming up in this industry, I think that every successful person, regardless in business, um, specifically in this industry has definitely had their moments where they're like, Hey, those things that I've experienced actually made me who I am today. And now I'm able to do more of it. And I'm able to be successful, understand and help other people. And so I want to hear uh, some of your challenges coming up in the daycare space. I know you said you had a couple of bad experiences. So I want to hear about that and how that kind of shaped how you do now. Cause for, for me, you, you definitely have a large influence on the team, obviously being the person that you are, um, by nature, but I think that how did those negative experiences affect how you make decisions day to day? Sure. Um, one situation in particular, uh, we were kind of talking about it off, off uh, camera was it was early, early on in my experience. There was a, a woman that was suffering from Parkinson's. And she had a new puppy and she really wanted to work this puppy. And, you know, I was working with them, with my mentor, but again, he would be absent sometimes. And so really, I would say the weight of wanting to help her and desperately trying everything to my, in my abilities to kind of get them to where they wanted to be. Uh, and obviously receiving a lot of feedback from them as well. Right. So 
the negative part of that was just the anxiety of it, right? It's like wanting to do a really good job and not fully being sure. Um, but then them being very cool people, right? And they helped build my confidence. Um, I would say it's that situation was really tough purely just because you wanted to do a good job, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily fully understanding how we could implement e collar, right? That kind of worried me a bit. But overall, you know, through trial and error, we made a lot of good progress. Uh, but for me, it was this, the anxiety of that situation was the hardest with that one in particular. Right. Um, you know, outside of that, like I've worked for individuals that didn't necessarily value dog training in the way that we see and value dog right. training here. Um, that was probably the toughest thing that I came across, you know, just being at odds with the individuals that I worked for, like desperately knowing we could do a lot more, but just not necessarily, you know, aligning when it comes to mindsets, when it comes to how we approach things. And I've always been a stronger dog handler at a lot of the facilities that I've worked at, um, but I just put a lot of work into being a stronger handler. And so wanting to influence things in a very positive way sometimes was very difficult because I would just get a lot of pushback, right? We wouldn't see eye to eye. Um, they didn't want to necessarily listen to the advice and therefore, you know, it just, it just made it difficult to work together. Um, you know, literally right before I came here, uh, just working with a really difficult manager, just really kind of just right. really just didn't see eye to eye. And I would say the dog training was very simple in that situation. But again, with the weight of having an individual kind of working against you when the overall goal was just helping dogs, you know, that that just makes it really tough to continue to do a good job and to right. continue to help clients uh, to the to the degree that we can help clients and, and to the degree that we're helping them here. You know what I mean. Um, it was mostly working with more difficult people that made the come up a lot harder. Right. It was, it was a lot more of a grind than so it was the people. needed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. People made it very difficult to kind of get here, but you know, you stuck to it and now we're here. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that, um, uh, we, when we get into kind of this phase, we start doing, having a lot of conversations that's very deep conversation. Um, well, obviously not so deep anymore because it's going to be public, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, uh, the people, uh, at least from the management side, cause you know, when we look at things from the management side and then we look at it from the pet owner side, and then you look at it from the team side, the biggest challenge that I think we're always going to, that we're going to face in pet care is the people and is in the management. You know what I'm saying? Cause I think that, you know, my nature, there's definitely growth. The way, you know, kind of look at it from the apprentices stand, um, standpoint i think that i've going to see training um or general pet care as in like pet care should increase the quality of your dog's life right it's just not you know uh, and i have nothing against like dogs running around in daycare and playing in daycare and stuff like that i actually enjoy it you know i think it's a good mix but i don't think it's everything right and i think a lot of trainers kind of defer um i spent most of the time looking at instagram and saying you know like people saying oh we hate the dog park and you know dogs playing and you know and I actually like the dog park with a good dog that's under control and you gauge in the situation. I think it's fun. People enjoy it. Um, you know, um, and, um, kind of getting back to what I was saying is that, uh, I kind of start looking at pet care and training as kind of the same thing, because when the dog's coming into your facility and the dog's coming to your training team or in, on a day to day basis, like the, the least you can expect is basic care, but also like the care for the day. Dog's tired, but also like over time, improve the quality of life of your dog and the skills, right? And that's kind of what we're shooting for. And what goes hand in hand with that is kind of our apprenticeship program. And I think that, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, we're kind of hitting that topic because I've grown to develop, to see it as a, uh, uh, this career as stages, right? Because I think that there's like the, you get interested in dogs and you have to decide, do I like dogs this much? Right. Do I like dogs as much? Do I like uh, dog owners and people this much with their dogs in order to help them uh, repetitively or take care of the dogs regularly? I think that's the biggest thing that people you know, have to figure out first is do you genuinely enjoy this? Because the only way you're going to do really well is if you genuinely enjoy what you're doing. And that goes for all professions. You know, my siblings are all on different things. And, and that's the question that we ask ourselves. Are we all happy and enjoying those things? And the next step to that is how can I become like technically savvy 
you know, because getting to know the dog and getting to know good health care uh, of the dog's facility care, uh, genuine understanding of the way they work, it takes a couple of years. I mean, it takes like, you know, two to three years. And sometimes I think about like, you know, uh, training programs and they go six months and then people are like, hey, I'm a really good dog trainer. And it's like, man, I don't know. Like I've, I've seen some stuff, right? I've seen some shit. And, and that's where we get ahead of ourselves and then start causing problems, right? For the client, for yeah. the owners and stuff like that. And I'm not trying to talk about it because I've made those mistakes. Like I've been cool. like, I remember there was a time when I was like 25 or 26. That's probably the worst time to be a guy because it's like you're the most confident. <laughs> you're like, you, you know, I've been sitting over there like I'm almost 25. Um, and what's funny is that I was to be like, man, I'm an amazing dog trainer. I'm, I got to be the best dog trainer here in the city. I got to be, you know, and then yeah. I would look at like guys like Bart online and like, you know, doing all these different things. And I would be like, man, that stuff's like useless. And now I, obviously I went to Bart school. I'm a gold graduate. I did the whole thing, you know, and I've definitely been humbled in my, in my time. But what ends up happening is that you, you, you know, like you have to understand that to really understand dogs, it's like a life stage. Like you first, you got to spend three or four years really around them physically and like taking care of them, making sure their needs are met, learning about them. Um, you know, and maybe a short amount of time if you're really in the right environment. And at some point you got to take a deep dive. You do. I mean, if you want to be really, really good, very competent, you have to take a deep dive at some point in your life. Dude, like, I, I think two, we three years where it's just straight dogs. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think that like looking at our timeline now, it's like 18 months of like all dogs every day, weekends, special events, PSA, like in 18 months of compressed time, you're like, oh, it's a functional person here, right. you know? And that's like, a, I don't know, 3000 hours or whatever of like really, you know, hardcore time. Um, and so like, that's, that's kind of what I consider the second step of this is like, okay, you have your uh, getting to know dogs and then you have your um, now it's time to like, start learning my vocation, right? And start learning my vocation. And that's kind of where like some of our apprentices go on rotation. And for people that don't know about found, and honestly, we're not very public about this either, is that we grab our apprentices and we are entry level guys or apprentices. And then our second set of, or like a more senior apprentices are guys that we put on rotation, right? And where rotation literally sounds what it is, is that we have a, a few different departments. We have Pupstar, Pupstar Plus. We have a couple slots in the training office. We discontinued the mojo slot because nobody wanted to work the store. <laughs> they didn't see any value in it yet. They're listening to this and they're like, oh, God, really? You know, now they're all asking for mojo uh, to have a slot again. And um, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But so what's funny is that we then assign them to like key departments and then they get, um, you know, mentored by guys like you, you know, like that are like really spending the time, which is amazing. Like, honestly, when I think about that, I'm like, wait, so you're getting to come here and go to work. And then you have a guy like Justin who did all the suffering to help be part of this team to then spend the time to literally out of his day, like Justin, like, will stop what he's doing be like, okay, let me go show you this and spend a good chunk of the day teaching you. And then you got your responsibilities, your follow-ups, your emails, your customers, you know, your, your customer follow-ups and stuff like that. And it's wild to me. And I think that when we live day to day, we kind of forget about that, all, you know, what the real opportunity is and what you're yeah. really bringing to the table for these guys. And so, you know, they're kind of, they, they get mentored in that rotation and, and what has really come about now, now there were, um, not even, I think we're about nine months, maybe less than that in a rotation, six months to rotation, six, seven months. Yeah. Six or seven. We've rotated this, we're going to rotate third time being yeah. up to this. We haven't told what people where they're going. Um, but we know, um, and <laughs> we know where you're going. And so in that stage, what people have said to me is that after I spent three weeks, I spent uh, three weeks with Pup Start and I was there with Jen, uh, both Jens and Tamar. And something that came to mind that they said was, Fabian, like, I completely understand what you're saying. I definitely understand the terminology. You, you're telling me to do the same thing. And I agree with them. It was like, I can't possibly tell you to do this the same way another time, right? You need to. And they come to the conclusion that's like, and it was Jennifer Basker that said this. She said, I just need more reps. I literally just need more physical reps. I get what you're saying. I get how you do it, but I just need more physical reps to do it. Yeah. And like kind of looking at it from a scientific standpoint, as a human, you know, to build that muscle memory, you need reps. You need thousands yeah. of reps, right? And 
um, thousands of reps. And it's funny because that's kind of the next stage. It's like you learn to love dogs, you're learning your vocation, and you realize that like as amazing as you want to be right away, you can't. Because there's a level of science that goes into all of this, even for yourself in terms of the learning curve, what, you know, like uh, how your learning curve, but also how you did that day, you know, because you could have days where like, hey, I had a stomach ache or it was like really hot outside. It wasn't myself. And so you have to, in order to do good reps, you have to master yourself and be like, I don't care what else is going on in my life. I'm here to train this puppy or this dog or this reactive dog. And I'm going to do clean reps to make sure the dog gets what they need. And also for me to develop my skills some more, right? And that's never ending for trainers. And I think that was a, a, a pretty interesting realization. And that takes about, that takes about two years, man. Like it really does. And, yeah. and uh, I think that, you know, obviously your department is like a big muscle in terms of like skill. We just did our assessment test and, um, um, you know, and your department just like, blew it out of the water. It was like 90 in the nineties percent for all those guys. So I was really impressed. I think that, um, we almost didn't test one of our guys, uh, that just got promoted to a training spot. And, um, and we ultimately did. And it was like one of those things, trust but verify kind of situation, you know, yeah. where it was like, Hey, Justin, uh, we should really get him to test. And it was like, we're, you know, we already trust him. Right. And we trust them. But let's verify that. And that's something we learned in business. Yeah. And he did amazing. I think he's tied for first place. Yeah. It, so that was, I'm glad that that matched up when he made his choice. Yeah. But I'm no, um, really, really proud of how they performed. Um, and the what I took away from it is it's a lot of the conversations that we're having more so than the physical reps all the time. Um, just seeing them hear the stuff that they need to apply in real time, just in conversation, and really be able to think about it more deeply. Um, you know, in, in addition to those three individuals in particular being very interested and very committed to what they're doing, right? Like the, all the stars align and they're just performing very, very well. Really happy to be working with, with my team for sure. Um, What's been your approach to, to them? Because I feel like the, you and I have over the years have ups and downs in terms of white team. And we've actually debated with each other, and which is I found it to, in hindsight, to be very healthy because we've learned a good a way to debate about beliefs is specifically with our team and, and management. But um, I kind of want to know your approach because over recently, like I've seen Justin, you know, over the last couple of months become this like figure to the training department, obviously to the community, everything that we're doing here. But I think that for your team, there's just that level of influence. And so what do you think is different now than it was, you know, three years ago when you joined the team? And obviously a lot of things since transpired since then. Um, yeah. One of the one of the main things is being mindful of my experience. And I think one of the things that we've conversated about a lot is how hard to push people, when to push people, are they ready for that, right? And so being mindful of that, I at least um, try to allow them very comfortable shadow opportunities, right? That allowed them to see how I handled a lot of situations, which built a lot of confidence. Um, we tag team sessions quite a bit. So in real time, they're getting a lot of experience working with the client, teaching something very specific, but they don't have the anxiety of having to do it all themselves, right? Yeah. It's, Hey, I'm going to take a step back. Why don't you coach this client on leash walking mechanics? And I'll take over from there. Right. So moments like that have definitely helped to build the confidence of our individuals that came in with like no experience doing anything like that. Um, having healthy relationships, right? Taking a second, having conversations, um, getting to know them, right? Really kind of knowing my team and knowing when I can push them or are they really ready? Um, learning their anxieties, right? I just personally care deeply about who they are, how they're developing and them being comfortable while simultaneously being a little uncomfortable, right? Right. Cause again, they have to get out of that comfort zone to develop skill and develop confidence. But it's just being there as a supportive individual to help manage that 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 stress. You know what I mean, um, they're never on an island by themselves, but I'm definitely not going to do it for them all the time. Right. And I think that's where the value has been. They they get all the reps that they could possibly ever need with plenty of guidance, plenty of communication. I'll pop in for two minutes. Hey, I see you're doing this. Let's try this. Get some results. Cool. I'll pop out. Let you do what you're doing and. 
you know, come check back in later. Yeah, dude, because I think that one of the things that we've talked about recently is being the, because when you say comfortable, it's like, they're, it's comfortable, bro. It's, it's like, uh, it's like comfortable, comfortable, because I think that like most of the time, and Brittany, uh, who will be on the podcast at a later time, uh, it's one of the things that she's brought up and she brings up this scenario all the time. And guys, some of the things that I'll, I'll bring up in this example, please don't judge me. I was like, 20, I was like 23 years old running a place. Not even, I was like 22 years old running a place, you know, trying yeah. to do my best and applying whatever experience I had. But I had the, um, you know, talking about comfortable, like my go-to thing was the opposite. Like I, I, I think uh, we talk about, there's systems that are designed to weed out people, and then there's systems that are designed to make people good at what they do, right? And I think that, in my experience, you know, they both apply depending on the situation. But I didn't realize for many years that what I had was a weed out system, you know? And I think Brittany obviously ended up marrying me and for whatever God, for whatever <laughs> reason, uh, she's crazy. Um, and um, because, she was kind of like the victim of one of those things of comfortable. I remember when she first came in and we were doing a lot of work with a bully breed, like a lot of pit bulls. And you know, like there's like the pit bulls that everybody witnesses and I think not to trick anybody, but there's like differences within the pit bulls, right? But we, uh, when we first started found, uh, it was a nonprofit organization. And we said, we will take the worst dogs out there. Like we will take the worst situations that they need a place to go and that can really put the resources to it. And so we got that, right? You know, whatever, it, you got exactly what you asked for. And so at the time, we just had a lot of pit bulls, a lot of stress, a lot of dogs with a uh, difficult background and and from dog finding rings and anxiety. And, you know, we got from Animal Control and our partnership with them at the time. And so Brittany came in for a work interview uh, and she's like, okay, cool. Like, uh, time to handle some dogs, right? And they was just like, okay, here's a leash. Get the dog out. Don't get bit, right? And... And she was like, okay, you know, like she was just like, okay. And she sees a trooper, worked around dogs for a long time, um, all through college and and has always been around situations. She grew up with traumatic things happening with her, her dogs. And, you know, so she's definitely aware of the situation. But there's a lot of people that weren't. And so ultimately she did that. And one of the things that I did kind of reminded me when you said that about the appointments is that I legit asked her to teach a group class like right there and then in the spot, like she was standing next to me and there's a group class going on. And then, uh, there's another trainer with us. And I said, okay. And then half of you guys are going to go with Brittany right here next to you. And you know, she's like 22 years old at the time. And she's like, <laughs> oh crap. Like I don't... she said, yes. And she goes on there. And I felt so bad. Cause I remember a thing like, I remember that just not working out and like she, and looked good from a distance. But then when she was yeah. there, like I made a fool of myself and she was really upset about it. Yeah. And and I think that, um, you know, when you said comfortable, I think about that. And I also think about how you and I uh, debate that yin and yang that I mentioned the other day. I was like, you and I are yin and yang because I feel like at any one time, the, and this should be an ongoing deal that you have, that you and I have. And it is like, if I'm making things too easy, you're making them hard, right? Yeah. And if And if you're making things too easy, my job is to make them. Right. And yeah. I think that that's like the that's fairly accurate because we're never completely not aligned. Right. Um, but, yeah, I think there's certain areas where I push a little bit harder. I want to be a little bit more strict and I think vice versa, for sure. It's a very healthy balance, actually, from yeah. my perspective. No, for sure. And I think that that was one of the things where, like, last time um, uh, when we had our first apprentice assessment, uh, which was about a couple months ago we had done a physical hands-on technical assessment. And I think at the time it was nobody was suspecting it. And I think that you had, you know, we gave, you had mentioned giving somebody like giving them prep, prep time and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, and obviously we did it because I was like, no, they do this on a regular basis. They should just be able to do it on the fly. Right. Yeah. And so what ultimately um, happened was that um, we just decided to be easier on the grading to some degree. And this time around, they were expecting another technical assessment. We we're going to do the assessment. And I was like, oh, that's too easy. Let's do a written assessment, right? And then we got that written assessment done. And so I think that that's, um, you know, it's very interesting that you kind of develop those relationships over time because it is like, you know, we're kind of just making an entire piece of the career and, and breaking it down, which is like the reps part of it. And it's so important. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to that, like, I'd say that's the second part is the reps. And then the third part is understanding your kind of like limitations, 
um, and specialty, right? And I think that's a big part of that because I think that um, that's something that I think at our level is happening. It's like specialization. You've become kind of like the behavior guy. You're like the go-to behavior guy. And I think that when we first started, that was something you were just like, hey, I'm re really interested in. But now like, I don't know, 800 dogs later or something like that. Yeah, doing a lot of rehab dogs. You know, now you're like, oh, you're, you're like the guy. So uh, tell me a little bit about like, you know, that experience and the challenges and the difficulties. And honestly, I, you know, some things that I regret because I think that there is um, the purpose of kind of telling stories when in, in dog training and telling stories from our perspective is really to prevent other people from experiencing those things. I think the yeah. other day, Ivan uh, texted me a picture. He texted me a picture of a dog. He's like, hey, there's this dog Seamus here at the store. And, um, you know, he sent me a picture of Seamus and the dog's name was McBride a while back. And um, he's like, hey, man, what do you, I, I forgot. What did you, what did you say? What did you at the time? I texted you the photo and he's like, um, he said uh, the owner was like, Fabian, like changed his dog's life around. uh, uh Something like that. Something along those lines. He was basically saying like, oh, like he gave him like another chance right. or something. No, so no. I sent him a photo. I'm like, look at this. It's your friend Seamus. Yeah. And it was, a, and I looked at the dog and I'm like, oh my God, I got that dog so injured, you know, by uh, not following protocol, you know, not following my own rules. I got that dog injured yeah. and ultimately he got his, he got bit by another dog. He had just been, you know, uh, this is the reason we don't kennel dogs together. The main reason. The other dog that he was staying with just went to town on him and the poor dog had a cone on. So he couldn't defend himself. I felt awful about it. And yeah, we spent nine months rehabbing, you know? And I think that for the longest time, I remember during this time, like I went out and it was like raining and there's like raindrops hitting my face. And I was like, God, there is not one worse day that can be than this today. And then we spent nine months rehabbing. I spent nine months driving that dog back and forth and getting his feel better and whatever. And then he ultimately did not succeed, and then he took care of that foot himself. Um, and Ivan was not expecting that story when he sent me that text no. message. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that extreme. I'm, like, a big, like, rule follower for for that reason and really promote, like, the safety of people. As much as people, like, things like, you know, like, hey, you know, this kind of pushing. I'm like, yeah, but, like, we kind of know where to draw the line in terms of safety. And so I kind of want to hear a little bit about, like, your stories and and kind of the things, the lessons, because behavior work is not easy. I mean, part of the reason we don't really let people learn behavior, I mean, we're like, honestly, learning behavior work from you. And I would say our team's got some hidden gems because we're not really public and we really don't broadcast a lot of that stuff. We're busy doing the dog stuff. We're, this is yeah. the first time we're really talking about it. We're busy doing the dog stuff, going through the dogs, spending the time doing it. And, you know, Nikki, who was supposed to shoot here with us, she's like, you know, I got some dogs to prioritize this morning, so I'll skip this first shoot and whatever. And that was perfectly fine. Obviously, that's... Um, you know, that's the mindset you promote, but the way you teach behavior is to being exposed to it. And you're human, adrenaline kicks in, shitty situations happen. Uh, and, uh, and the reason I call you a hidden gem is because you're teaching it in a way that's like safe for people and they get to see it and you're doing it firsthand. And like, they're learning all the safety strategies that we put in place over the years. Um, but we didn't just get there overnight. You know, it is dangerous to deal behavior work. Yeah. And, and, and so what are the things that have made you Justin in terms of handling that? Sure. Uh, one of the biggest things for me, um, kind of going back to one of the things you had mentioned is learning to master yourself. I used to not be as patient of a person. Learning patience was one of the biggest tools I had to develop because having this patience now allows me to think a lot deeper about the, the situation right. versus getting frustrated when it's not going your way. It's the keeping in mind that okay, this is just day one. These reps aren't going as well, but just imagine what happens with 10 straight days of like very focused effort. There might actually be a lot of progress. And so just not being overwhelmed by the grandness of the process was something really important that I had to actually like think about a lot, like on my own time and just process, right? Uh, another factor that's helped me develop behavioral side of things is protection work bite work oh yeah dude 100 percent. being able to really understand a dog in drive what it looks like when they're being more defensive what it looks like when they're actually being aggressive right not just what we humans perceive as aggressive like actual dude, aggression that's a big fact that's a big yeah, fact right there it, two two completely different things all stemming from totally different spaces right and so 
really seeing that difference in real time, like with Cora, my own Malawan, right? Like just reading the dog um, became a lot easier. And so that allows me to better understand, okay, this dog's just being really defensive in the kennel. It's showing teeth and lashing out at the leash, but it's not trying to take me out. Like I can approach this a certain way. And um, it just really empowered me to be a lot calmer and be a lot more mindful of how I handle these dogs. And yeah, to your point, I do approach dealing with clients and dealing with the apprentices and my team working these dogs in a very safe way because A, it's just mandatory. It has to be safe, right? If we're going to make any progress with these dogs, it has to be safe. Um, and we just promote a lot of very safe protocols when it comes to handling. Right. Right. They're, they're, you can't be too loosey-goosey with a dog that's suffering from, you know, extreme stress and yeah. anxiety and has a major bite history. Right? And one of the things that I've noticed, like specifically, like you specializing in that, right? Like in that specifically behavior side of things was that um, aspect of developing things that other people don't, right? And I think that that's, that's the, a, a big thing there really for anything. Like guys that decoy, you know, there's some decoys out there that look like they're dancing and they're super flexible and they, do, they develop that aspect of things. Like you're developing something that's incredibly useful, I would say for our society and for the demands that we have, which is the the experience in the bite work, the uh, and then the experience of the bite work and the training you've done with the PSA, and then also like the behavior side of knowing when the dog's actually wanting to bite and yeah. when the dog's not wanting to bite you. Uh, and I mean, that's an oversimplification about what, about what that, how that happens. Yeah. But I think that you and I um, obviously come from like approach, have approached reactivity, uh, or I thought we approached reactivity very different, but it's actually very much the same. But one of the things that I valued about you is the level of breaking it down and the like the long like kind of the way you call it like i've seen the long game kind of play out and that kind of stuff stresses people out i mean i think it that does. especially like people apprentices that are coming into this area where they feel like even seasoned trainers like man i've been working with this dog for like six months or like three weeks you know and i'm not seeing any progress i don't know what to do and this month and there's like dogs that we've worked with for like months and i've seen you kind of follow training plans for a long time like over a year in terms of that application and stuff and so i think that that's something that you really narrow down is like you're able to kind of foresee like how things are going to play out yeah no for sure it's obviously dogs are all different they all have different personalities their triggers are all different but a lot of what can be very similar is how they interpret stimulus right and then the, what they put out right and so being more aware of kind of how they respond to stimulus, right? Even though the stimulus might be more random, understanding those responses really helped me have some foresight and like what's gonna happen. Like, okay, cool. We're working around bites, your dog's doing great. If that person talks to your dog, it might lash out as that's just a higher level of difficulty for your dog. And so being mindful about those things and just being able to, in a very uh, clear way, communicate right. to clients like, okay, don't get overwhelmed by the randomness, right? Let's just approach it with a very structured, right, process. Right. This ritual is going to help you get through any random situation. You know right. What I mean, um, and yeah, there needs to be a lot of follow through. And that's just one of the things that I explain really deeply in our evaluations and ongoing. And uh, I found a lot of value in coming up with legitimate game plans for people. They feel more comfortable when there's a true plan in place, mm -hmm. not just session to session, right? It, they they like, in, at least my perception and the feedback that I've gotten is they feel a lot more comfortable knowing that there's a true game plan. Right. And even though we might not hit our mark in the first two or three weeks, we have a six-month plan. And by six months, we're achieving all the goals that we really wanted to achieve. Right. And, you know, I just seen a lot of power in that and just really convincing the owner that being very consistent is, is just the way to go. Right. The dog typically. Right. These dogs desperately need a lot of guidance um, because they just have developed and conditioned themselves to have more un unsavory responses to these stimulus. Right. Yeah. Is there any specific dog that you can think of? And I'm sure there's plenty of that like taught you a very specific lesson about like behavior work. And the reason I asked that is because like, unfortunately that is, uh, that is behavior work. You can study it and you can read it. And there's plenty of people that go on there and they're just like books, 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 books. And, and, and it's one of those things where in dog training, 
all things are true about dog training. And we say mm-hmm. that, like all things are true about dog training, but not everything applies at that one time in that moment, yeah. in that week for that dog, for that owner, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I think that there's definitely lessons that, that have, you know, you've kind of picked up along the way. Yeah, for sure. There, there's one in particular I have in mind. I forget the dog's name off the top of my head. Um, it was maybe one or half, two years ago at this point. Um, but I'll never forget the eval because I remember uh, Nikki was actually sitting in on the eval with me and it was a wife and a husband, right? They sat down, they came in with the dog. Dog was very defensive, like came in full muzzle, full basket yeah, muzzle, muzzle fight, right, from stomach. like intense lunging at me. Just we could barely hear each other because he was freaking out, right? And finally calms down and like the mom's in tears, right? The wife's in tears, the husband's kind of sitting there and he's just kind of, he, he would go away on work, you know, every so often. And the biggest issue that they had had was when he wasn't there. And there was one experience in particular that she mentioned where she was sitting down eating dinner and the dog was just kind of sitting on the ground next to her. It's totally fine. And then from her perspective, all of a sudden he looked at her and then lunged and like literally like bit her on like the oh, head, wow. you know what I mean? Really? and really went at her and they were at the point where it was like i don't actually feel safe in my own home right um I, like you're not here to help with this so like we need to either commit to this training or like we just got to get rid of something right, right. like there, something has to change because he she's literally breaking skin and like going after her right and so we did a modified program and for those who don't know that's just a program where the dog comes and stays with the trainer in their home um, and we work on whatever type of training they need to work on, just in the home environment. And he came into my home and he lived with me and my dogs and my girlfriend for a while. And ultimately, we just focused on structure, right? Giving him rituals to help him right. learn how to be most successful because we couldn't trust that when left to his own devices, he wouldn't actually lash out. And even walking around the facility, I remember like I had brought him into the PSA room one time and he was cool, but very sensitive to people, right? If they lock eyes, he wanted to blow up and lash out. And so it was our process. They did the three, now they did four weeks with me. And then obviously we had a bunch of follow-up sessions post that. And I would say over, I don't know, maybe yeah, about a six month period of like doing the follow-up sessions and whatnot. Months. Much, much more comfortable environment at home. Just understanding the value of structure. Our dog in particular might not need to just be up free roaming when we have guests come over. Right. We can give him the exposure and and let him be a part of our family, but under certain rules and boundaries, right? And then they've just found a lot of success with that. Right. The dog overall is a lot less stressed out with a lot of, you know, that being taken off of his plate. And just now at this point, like, there was one day I was coming outside uh, in front of found and they were actually driving by cause they don't live too far from us. And they were driving by and they were like, they just pulled up and were just like, Hey, like, Hey, it's good to see you. Just wanted to let you know, he's actually still doing really good. Like we are so happy we came and found found and we appreciate the process and like giving them a different state of mind about how to handle their dog, yeah. change their lives. And maybe marriage, maybe, you know, their Dude, relationship definitely. with the dog, like, because they were in conflicting. He didn't ever experience a lot of the stuff that she had. Right. And there was just, he just couldn't fully comprehend. Right. And if you don't experience something like a dog straight up attacking you, like, it's hard to comprehend yeah. how, how nerve wracking that could be. Yeah, it's a different feeling when the dog, it's a different feeling when you feel the dog sinks teeth into your flesh. It's yes. a whole different feeling. That yeah. changes, like, it's just like real. All Dude, she was terrified. She yeah. was terrified. And so. It feels really good to know that, yeah, myself, but the team as well, we're able to help them find a lot of comfort and truly quite possibly save that dog's life and save their relationship and just a peace within their own home. Yeah. On the, on the behavior side, I'm kind of curious, do you have any regrets on any um, dogs that perhaps that like you? You learned the lesson, but you learned it in hindsight. You know, like I, Gino's like that dog for me, right? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there's there's a good number. I can't think of. For me, it's always you know back when I was a little less experienced with equipment and whatnot. You know, maybe not fully grasping how to implement the equipment, and therefore not getting the result that I wanted. Um, you know, uh, 
that's really it. You know, I've been pretty successful with helping a lot of people, but I think it was just in the earlier stages of me being a trainer, I didn't fully grasp on how to best implement things like prong collar, right. collar, right? The tools that truly now have helped me be very successful with these dogs. Um, I think that I was just uh, approaching dog training, um, I would say, not as educated as I needed to be to make the best possible right. results. So I would say that I like in hindsight, there's dogs that, you know, I'll come in contact with or see them kind of walking around the neighborhood or something like that that I used to train in and say, okay, cool. Dog's still kind of reactive. Like in hindsight, I didn't necessarily approach it with this process that I, that I use now. Right. And I can see where there were some holes in the training. And so for those individuals, right. I always ask them, come back. I'm so much better now. I've developed a lot more of my skill set that can kind of help come back and clean things up. You know, sure. my leash walking mechanics weren't always that great. And I can see how that is allows someone to regain some of the issues in, in, in hindsight. What, um, you know, kind of, we, we talk about, we're talking a lot about experience and kind of like, that's that last point of like, uh, of training is understanding experience or like what your specialty is and building experience on that. And also at the same time, kind of learning the life cycle of dogs and people. And, and now you're at the mentorship stage, right? Like you're really spending a lot of time mentoring and that's kind of what the future and kind of dog tribe is going to turn into. It's like mentorship, consulting, the development of access for, for, you know, what we've learned here, uh, kind of like an organization level, like how we can teach other people. Um, what kind of advice do you have, you know, for uh, people getting into this field or honestly apprentices? Because I think that there's a big debate. I mean, there's like, we were talking about this just before we started, like there's like a paid apprentices. That's kind of the way I look at it. And I know a lot of people, you know, don't like the idea of like paid apprenticeships, but we do paid apprenticeships. I think that we're going to teach you how to train dogs. It's like yeah. Chicago, it's expensive. Everything is expensive. You got to pay them, you know, to do well. It also benefits the organization. We develop skill, we benefit, they grow their careers, you know, company grows too. Yeah. Um, but what advice do you have for people like getting into the field or I'm interested in dogs or like, you know, your background is like you kind of experience a lot of different forms of organization and dogs where some people have like just come here and just like, this is amazing. This is all they know. Yeah. Right. But you know, other things outside of that. And so what is yeah. your advice for apprentices and how to succeed in the roles, but what to expect out of coming from start to finish of becoming a dog trainer? Yeah. One of the, I would say one of the most common things that I've always heard within the industry is, you know, I'm, I'm here because I really like dogs and I don't necessarily <laughs> like people. It's like, but no. this is the wrong career to get into if you don't like people, since you have to very directly deal with the people on a very regular basis. You have to have the stamina to deal with people, and deal with sometimes difficult people, deal with sometimes very emotional people as, you know, their dogs are their family. Some with some people, these dogs are their kids. And, you know, if you don't have the stamina for that, it can become quite difficult depending on what type of cases that you work. I would say go into the industry having a better idea of kind of what you would like to do, right? Obviously, that develops over time. You know, it changes here and there, right? You get in and you get exposed to something brand new, and then you're like, okay, well, I kind of like that now, right? Um, but have a purpose, right? My purpose ultimately at a very fundamental level was I just desperately want to help dogs and helping people better understand how to communicate with dogs was that was just what I had to do. Right? Um, and so, yeah, have a mission, right? Don't just get into it because you just think dogs are really cute. Right. Have a mission, have a purpose, right? I would say go into this industry with the best intentions and you will receive rewards, right? right. You will come out uh, feeling very accomplished when you are actually helping dogs that you are capable of helping. Right. Um, you know, learn to be a team player as what I found is being a lone wolf in this industry is very difficult, very difficult. Relationships are extremely important, right? And so learn to develop communication skills, be a team player, as it's just so much more helpful and so much more, I would say, it's, it's a more fun experience when you have a true team with you right. to really develop and grow with, right? Things are way less stressful, way less scary when you have a solid team around. 
challenge, or at the very least, just a network of individuals that right. you trust and can bounce ideas off of and get advice from, right? Even if you don't have a official mentor, like try to find a mentor. Yeah, you gotta have one. Everybody gotta have one. one, you know? Um, and those are some of the things that I would want anyone brand new or early in their, you know, in their journey to really think about, right? Be, be the best version of yourself and right. these dogs and the people and the clients will appreciate it long term for sure. No, for sure. I think that you've said something about, um, being a lone wolf and even that, like, I've never been a lone wolf, right? Like, I I think that I've always, um, you know, uh, been around people. I feel like I've had to make a lot of teams. We've we've definitely spent the time making teams, breaking teams. We spend a lot of time breaking teams. Like, that's something that obviously a learning curve. And, and then I've met people that have never had to do that because they've had great mentorship. And I've been jealous. Yeah. I'm like, God, I've, like, pissed off so many people. Say, I'm like, I pissed off so many people. <laughs> trying to get to this point and building yeah. like a, a team that we respect and like, and we look forward to teaching every day and spending time with them. But there's people who have never had to experience that. So yeah, getting a mentor, it's a really big part of that. And I've had mentorship, uh, a hell of a lot of mentorship. I mean, I think that yeah. over time, the the main MO that I think we've experienced is like, hey, I want to uh, be, you know, I want to have an organization that grows to this degree too. So I have to leave the, this organization to then go and do something um, bigger. And I think it's like the biggest thing because because you did it. And it's like, bro, like I didn't I didn't do it myself. Like I think that the amount of dog training mentorship from like level of influence is so important. Like people mentor you. They don't even know their mentors. You don't even have to have a direct mentor that you talk to every day. But some, some people that you emulate, that you follow, that you like what they do, yeah. when you talk to them or you have the ethics, the same background, and you kind of like, because you need that. Everybody needs a support system. Like nobody, yeah. you know, and it's hard when you get together because we've kind of experienced this over time. And we're experiencing more and more now as we spend years together and kind of troubleshooting and uh, trauma bonding. <laughs> um, <laughs> trauma bonding. <laughs> Um, as we've kind of, you know, built our experience through this is that it's hard not to want to work together, right? And like you meet together and you ask advice and what do you think about this? And what are you doing this? And you're briefing each other. Even if you're uh, a soul, a lone wolf kind of guy or person, and then you're in that scenario where you're networking with a lot of people, it's hard not to just want to do something together, you know? And I think that picking the people, it's, it's a big aspect of that, picking the people that you want to um, having your circle is a, is a big thing with that. Um, what is your experience with, um, with, cause I know for some time, I know, uh, without mentioning any names for, for some time, you were kind of like an apprentice. You had just started the role of like non-paid, you know, apprentice. And so what, what's your feeling on paid apprentices versus non-paid apprentices? Uh, you know, and, and does that matter in motivation? Like, what are you seeing? What have you experienced? Mm. I don't think it always fully matters. You know, I I chose to do it because I desperately wanted to. I was, I'm, I'll never forget. I was 21 ish and just wasn't fully sure on where I wanted to go. And I was like, okay, if I don't figure it out now, like I'm gonna struggle in the future, right? And so I was just at a really good point where I was still living at home and I was able to kind of take the leap, right? I found. A, mentor and i was like i'm actually willing to do this unpaid i had some savings right so i was like i'm gonna live off this because i just desperately wanted the knowledge you know right um i think anyone that's willing to do that it definitely shows a lot of intent it shows a lot of passion it shows a lot of desire it's just very difficult to do right. especially in this day and age you know when we have we all got bills you know um i think that a paid apprenticeship can be just as valuable. I think it just depends on the caliber of person. Right. You know what I mean? I think if they're coming into it saying, cool, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity, right? I'm going to get paid for it. We have found that there are individuals that are making the most of it. Um, and I think that's kind of what it comes down to. Right. The individual themselves. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it Sure, it would be very easy to squander the opportunity. Right. Of being paid to be here, of viewing it as a job, Right. I think a lot of the team that we have now, they're not viewing it as just a job. It is actually their career and what they right. want to do. And so it's a no-brainer. They're going to give it their all. Yeah. Despite the it, fact that they're getting a paycheck. Getting a little cultish, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, that's good. You know, we, we, that's kind of where the name came from, Dog Tribe. You yeah, know 100%. Like, there's a lot to expand on that. Um, I think it's a very, within the industry itself, right, our just our, 
the community of dog training and dog stuff, right? The the idea of community is actually a very big thing, right? I think dogs in general promote community. Right. right. I know mean, for sure. And we were talking about that. Um, it's, come, it's come up a lot. And I think that where the majority of, of uh, the majority of people that come around, it's like when we're doing dog events and like for specifically for Mojo, it's really for like, you think about it, like people drop off their dogs for daycare, they go to work, they don't really, you know, they have lives, they don't have a lot of time to spend with their dog. And at the end of the day, if they can do social things with other people that they identify with and they get along with and they have the same values, and then on top of that can bring their dogs with, I think that's a big opportunity. But that's that's kind of everything. As much as people like, as long as the, as much as the lone wolf mindset does exist, I think we all eventually learn that like it's preserving the groups of people and finding the good group and we're kind of I mean, this first episode, uh, hindsight of everything with PSA, because for the longest time, I mean, there's like all sorts of, you know, uh, handler teams coming to PSA and, you know, the club. And I think that, you know, somebody had a lot of dogs, some people didn't have enough dogs, some people were just here to watch. And ultimately, like, you kind of have to decide the crowd, right? And the crowd, you know, for us, I start joking around is like, you either gotta, you gotta have two of these three things, right? And the two of these three things are, it's either you gotta be a nice person who would like you, you gotta have a nice dog, or you have to decoy, right? You gotta make a decoy. So you gotta have two of those three. You cannot have one. You can either be a good decoy, have a nice dog, and be a shitty person. You can be a shitty, you can be a nice person, and you know, and have a nice dog, but you don't decoy. But you cannot be missing one, or it's gonna be hard for us. Like you know, at the end of the day, like there's a lot of people out there. And, you know, you can hang out wherever you want, but. Uh, no, man, I think this has been a great conversation and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. Obviously, we're going to be doing this a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Um, guys, for people that are listening to this, obviously, Dog Tribe is step one of launching the podcast. Coming up in the next couple of months, we're going to be launching our vocational program. So, uh, Justin uh, is a gem and obviously, in the world, there's a lot of gems that don't get the attention online and you'll be seeing a lot more Justin, but we will be having those shadow opportunities uh, with Justin to kind of share that that knowledge and wisdom that he's accumulated over the years and you know and, and not necessarily just years of like oh look you know I trained dogs that we were you know we I was having this discussion with the ICP recently uh, it was kind of a debate of like years versus hours right and I think that the the main thing is that like you have years of like hours you know hours and hours in a lot of different experiences and so you know i think that that's like a hard thing to hard thing to develop in general and so having mentorship opportunities with you or shadow opportunities is going to be a great benefit to the dog community making sure that they can learn these skills safely um but uh, thanks so much for being on man and i think that guys we're going to wrap up and i uh, hope you guys enjoyed our first conversation